What could a 17 year old teach us about getting through tough times? Well, actually more than we think. Let's talk about it on this week's episode of Journey at Home. Hey, thanks for tuning in today. If you're anything like me, you have moments when the fear of the unknown makes it really challenging to do the right thing. You have moments when there's so much emotion, so much confusion, it's really hard to make a decision, and you probably have moments when you struggle to trust God. So what I wanna do today is introduce you to a question that's been incredibly helpful to me in making decisions and in fueling my spiritual growth. It's one of those questions that I think can provide clarity in circumstances where our emotions are clouding our judgment. It can provide direction in situations where we're confused, it can provide courage in moments when we're paralyzed by fear. And the question is this, what would someone like you do who was confident that God was with them? What would somebody in your current circumstances do if they had no doubt that God was with them? In other words, what would a senior in high school who just discovered, hey, they're not gonna get into the college of their choice do? Or what would somebody recovering from addiction do? What would somebody whose life is good, they're set financially, what would they do if they were confident that God was with them? What would a person whose life felt like it was falling apart right now, they're starting to panic, what would they do if they were certain God was with them? Or how about somebody who's struggling in their marriage or somebody who's just lost their job or who's facing some debilitating illness? Or what about somebody whose kids are going through a tough season? What would somebody like you in your current circumstances do if they were confident God was with them? See, I think that's a pretty challenging question, but it's a clarifying question too because it pushes aside all the fog of emotion. It, it pushes aside the pull of our personal desires and it pushes aside the paralyzing force of fear. And when you respond in your circumstances as if God's with you, well, guess what happens? You see God clearly in your circumstances. So we're gonna spend the next three episodes examining how one young man lived by this question over a 20 year period from the time he was 17 until his late 30s. Now you may be familiar with the story. His name is Joseph. And young Joe was a son of Jacob. See what we did there? Joe Jacobson. Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. And here's what makes his story so extraordinary. At one point, Joseph's circumstances were way worse than yours or mine. And at another point, Joseph was wealthier than we'll ever be. And at some point, Joseph had a level of power and opportunity for payback and for revenge that we'll never have. His is a story of extremes. And here's how it begins as told in Genesis 37. The writer says, Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, who were the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, you know this. When you have siblings and you become known as a tattletale, what's well, not going to go well for you, is it? And in this situation, it spirals downhill in a really extreme way. Now, the writer tells us that Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he'd been born to him in his old age. Who's a favorite? and he made an ornate robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of them, well, they did what you would expect them to do. They hated him and couldn't speak a kind word to him. So Joseph has created problems for himself, but now Jacob, his dad's creating more problems while playing favorites. And then to compound the problem even more, Joseph has two dreams where God gives him a glimpse into his future. And in both of these dreams, he sees himself in a position of power where his dad and his brothers are bowing down to him. And in this already tense relational situation, well, Joseph doesn't demonstrate very good judgment. He goes and he tells his older brothers about both dreams. And as you can imagine, it ignites this family powder keg. The story tells us when they heard it, they just hated Joseph all the more. So, some time passes. One day, Jacob sends Joseph to check on his brothers. They're out tending Jacob's sheep somewhere. As you might imagine, they are not very excited when they see this daddy's boy coming to see what they're up to. So as Joseph is approaching from a distance, his brothers decide this is a perfect opportunity to kill Joseph. Yeah, not pick on him, kill him. So when Joseph arrives, they ambush him, they throw him in an empty cistern, and then they sit down to eat while they plan how they can murder him and get away with it. Can you imagine hating a brother so much that you can't wait to kill him? Well, as they're sitting there around lunch plotting his death, one of the brothers looks up and he sees a caravan of Midianites approaching. 
And Judah, who is the fourth oldest of all the brothers, he gets this idea. So Judah looks at his brothers and he says, well, what are we going to gain if we kill our brother and we cover up his blood? Come, let's, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And all the brothers agree. They're like, oh, man, you know. So you can imagine Joseph's thinking, oh, thank you so much for your compassion, brothers, right? I mean, you're going to kill me. Now you just found an opportunity to sell me. You're going to make some money for yourself. You're going to fake my death. It's so thoughtful, you know. This is a dysfunctional family. So when these Midianite merchants came by, his brothers do just that. They pull Joseph up out of the cistern. They sell him for 20 shekels to the Ishmaelites, who then take Joseph to Egypt. Now, this is where I believe Joseph's story intersects with ours because it raises some questions we've all wondered. Would God allow something like this to happen to someone that he actually cared about? I mean, surely God's going to intervene for somebody he loves. Where's God when life goes south? Where's God when Joseph's in the bottom of a cistern? Where's God when he's sold as a slave? Why does God sometimes not answer our prayers? I mean, you know Joseph was praying in the bottom of that well. Why didn't God rescue him? You've probably asked those questions at times, haven't you? Because we all have these moments when life makes no sense and you just don't know where God is. There are moments when you feel like you've been doing what God wants you to do, but then life falls apart and bad things happen and he doesn't seem to show up for you. There are moments that are going to drive you to question whether God cares and whether he's there and why he won't answer your prayer. See, when you find out you can't get into your top school or when you realize you're not going to have the chance to pursue the career of your dreams, or when your parents sit you down and tell you, hey, it's not your fault, but we're getting a divorce, moments when you find yourself in an abusive relationship or when your job's miserable but there's no clear way out, that moment when the doctor says, hey, there's nothing else she can do. The moment when your spouse says to you, I'm leaving, I'm done. Or the moment when you're at the funeral of a child. You know, the severity of these moments may be different for each of us. But the questions we ask, the doubt we feel, well, that's the same, isn't it? It's like, where is God? Why would he let this happen? Because after all, I didn't do anything to deserve this. So why wouldn't he answer my prayer? Well, as Joseph is tied up, you know, pulled along across the desert, stumbling at the back of this caravan of camels. He had plenty of time to ask those questions. He had plenty of time to wrestle with those doubts. He had plenty of time to feel the intense pain that only a sense of abandonment can bring, which makes the next part of this story so frustrating. The writer tells us, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So Joseph becomes just another slave in an Egyptian economic machine that's built on slave labor. And just like the thousands of other slaves during that time, we should have never heard from Joseph again. But then we read these unbelievable, and if we're being honest, somewhat infuriating words. The writer says, The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Oh, so God did show up, and he must have blessed Joseph for being a good person. He must have given him his freedom back, right? Well, that's what we think prospering would look like, but nope. The Lord was with Joseph, and he helped him prosper as a slave. The Lord was with Joseph so that Potiphar, the Egyptian slave master, prospered. And that just doesn't seem right, does it? This is where we get thrown for a loop. You know, if the Lord was with Joseph, none of this would have happened to Joseph. If God was with him, good things would happen to good people and bad things would happen to bad people. But that is not what happens in the story. And you know that's not what happens in life. God was with Joseph, and at the same time, he did nothing to make things right for Joseph. God didn't abandon Joseph, but he also didn't rescue him. And Joseph had to decide whether God was worth following even when God didn't do what he wanted him to do. And there's the tension we all eventually face, isn't it? There's the tension that some of you, you're living in right now. Life doesn't make sense. You're letting your circumstances define how you view God's activity in your life. And you're thinking, well, since life isn't good, God must not be either. Since life isn't fair, God must not care. But there is a direct correlation between the circumstances of our lives and the love God has for us. Well, no, that's not true. So here's what I want to challenge you to ask yourself this week. What would you do if you were confident God is with you? 
in your present circumstances, if you had no doubt that God was with you just like he was with Joseph, well, what would you do? How would you react? What choice would you make? How would you respond? What step would you take? Where would you be emotionally? How would you make decisions differently? Who might you treat more lovingly and patiently? What would you do if you were confident God is with you? Now, will you just take that step and do it? Because that's what it means to trust God. That's what it means to walk by faith. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Here's what I know. You will never see God if you're convinced he's not there. You'll never know he's with you if you believe your circumstances have power over you. You're going to miss him if you're not trusting him. A 17-year-old young man sat in the slave quarters of his Egyptian master and had to decide whether to do what anyone would do who was confident God was with him. And you and I, well, we have to decide the same thing. Whether things are good or things are bad, things are just normal, wherever we are. What would it look like to live this week confident God was with you? Will you spend a little bit of time considering that question? Will you start each day asking yourself that question? Because it just might be the question that changes everything for you. And we'll pick up the story right there next time in episode two of the life and times of Joe Jacobson.